Good afternoon and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate here on the iSelect Fund Ventures team. I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month we highlight a specific theme and this month's theme is cattle technology. On today's call, we're joined by Frank Wooten, CEO of Vents. The Vents livestock management platform brings total insight of the herd from the farm to your smartphone. Control the movement and grazing of animals directly in real time or set a schedule using artificial intelligence to optimize rotational or strip grazing and maximize land yield. Create virtual fences anywhere to dictate grazing behavior or specify protected areas and use the app to get up-to-date information about the animal well-being from sensors worn by the livestock. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We have invited you to this call because you're some of the smartest, most talented people in Vence's market. You're potential customers for Vence's products and services. You have built a company similar to Vence, or you have unique expertise in understanding understand the challenges and opportunities that Vence may face. Now, before we get started, we have a few process comments. Um, so Frank, if you could jump to that slide too, that would be great. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Vents find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships to help them grow their business. You can use the Q&A box, box to ask a question at any time, and we will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay on both the iSelect Fund website at agrifoodconversation.com and also on our YouTube channel. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Frank Wooten, CEO of Vents. Frank, thanks for your take it away. Everyone, thank you for, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to, to, to listen to me ramble a little bit about uh, livestock management and, you know, what we've been building at Vents over the last couple of years. You know, we, we started the company out and actually we founded it in 2016. And uh, over the past couple of years, we've been, we've been building prototypes and devices to, to control cattle and, and train them to, to react to sound and, and stimulus so that we can uh, virtually fence them. We are commercially launching that product. We commercially started launching it in, in 2021 and, you know, are live on nearly you know, 25 farms across the U S and Australia at this point in time and expanding pretty rapidly, you know, at, at a high level, we view ourselves and I'll stick with this page just for a second here. We view ourselves as a tool in the tool belt of, of, of livestock farmers. And you can, you can see different businesses in different industries around the world that have moved to a, you know, data driven model in terms of how they manage their, their businesses. And one of the things that is severely lacking in much of agriculture, but particularly in the livestock business is the ability to, to get real time specific data on, on animals. You know, our insight is that in addition to real time insight on animals, you also want to have real time control of those animals so that you can actually act based upon whatever you're seeing. You know, overview of the industry. I know that, you know, we're talking to, to a group of advisors who may you already have pretty deep insight in this, but I uh, you know, like to start off with you know, our, our belief as it relates to the industry. And we, we hear a lot about alternative proteins and, and, and things along that, that sort. And we certainly think there's a place in the world for that, but you know, based on population, you, there is almost no way that you will see beef decline in my opinion, over the next 20 plus years in terms of the, the demand for it. You know, 38% of the global landscape is actually pastures. And so when we look at that, you know, one of the things that, that we're pretty confident and able to say is like, pastures aren't going to become more of the global landscape. They may become less of the, the global landscape. And in order to continue to increase production beef to meet population demands, we're going to have to be able to do more with less. And one of the ways that you can do more with less on a livestock farm is via fencing and labor. You know, it is a grass factory and, and fences and labor are what allow you to allocate the animals in the right place at the right time to eat the right feed to create your end product, which is either meat or milk. You know, when you look at kind of regenerative agriculture, you know, at scale, 
one of the real challenges when we go talk to producers and when we even look at things like the NRCS adoption rate of rotational grazing and the challenge is actually that our customer base is is already oversubscribed with tasks that they need to do in any particular and you know they don't have time to take on more managerial skills and and tasks they're already you know up to their necks in terms of work and our product you know in creating the ability to prescribe pastures and custom manage how animals are controlled enables them to do that without additional employees as well as without additional infrastructure costs associated with it some of the biggest names across the agricultural world are really focusing on how do we start to increase this you know kind of adoption rate of, of regenerative agriculture our product is you know, really the nuts and bolts of it are are the you know there, there is a, a base station which is uh, on the left side of your screen here it's a small tower that creates a radio frequency network over over and that communicates with collars that uh, small base station communicates up to to the cloud and from the cloud you're able to access where your animals are you're able to change where your fencing is you're able to move your animals you're able to monitor their well-being from anywhere on the planet when we think about why people are going to adopt this. People don't just look to adopt regenerative ag because they're doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Always it, it, it's, it's a question from our customers of, you know, what is the benefit to them? It's either going to come out of increased payments on a per pound basis to some, to, to an offtake partner, you know, when they sell that animal, or it's gotta be increase of, of, of increased pounds of beef produced per acre or decreased costs on a, on a per animal basis. Our product enables two of those. It really able, enables the, the producer to increase the overall carrying capacity of their land by you know, more precisely allocating those animals to it. And it also allows them to decrease their infrastructure and labor costs associated with fencing and moving and controlling animals. So it creates this one-two punch, which, which really drives a pretty high ROI uh, this is just a you know, one of our example customers is Leo Barthelmus, hey, but he's pretty pretty representative. You know, he's a 63 year old man, lives in Montana, works 70 plus hours a week. You know, which you, we can talk about how sustainable that really is in the agricultural world. But that, I think that's a it's an entire uh, other agri foods conversation. You know, when we put our devices out on his property over the previous. You know, 30 plus years, he put up, you know, roughly 30 miles of fencing within six months, he put up the equivalent of 60 miles of fencing, you know, from via virtual fencing, he was able to reduce his feed costs as well as reduce, you know, his labor and infrastructure costs significantly and achieve a really high ROI, you know, within a short period of time. When you you look at somebody like Leo and you think about their farm and, and, and how all of the different things are managed. You know, they're not managed via one platform at, at this point in time. And there are a couple of other companies that are that are working on creating the, the backbone you know, of the farm. We think that the interesting aspect as it relates to to our product is that it does so with specific insight to the animals and with specific control. Uh, of the animals so that you can incorporate that into the picture because the land and the animals are the single largest driver of value on that property. You know, everything else is just a lever off of that. When we, when we look at the sequencing of how we will continue our product roadmap and how we, we think about the future of the product, you know, we're starting with this idea of controlling the primary assets, which is that land and those animals. And you know, on those devices, we are capturing not just the data of GPS, but we're capturing other things as it relates to, you know, animal behavior, temperature, you know, uh, movement patterns. That data is going to really lead us to what we believe is a deep intelligence layer so that we can go back to that customer and say, this is how you're controlling your animals now. Here's the data that we have that we think could help you 
you know, change some of that and improve that to improve your profitability. So that, that circle of the connected farm really, you know, starts in our opinion with control because otherwise you're throwing an additional work stream at your customer without giving them a way to handle it. You know, you're just throwing data at them and they've got no way to actualize anything about that data. So this is a, a view of, of what it looks like to virtually, you know, herd a, a group of cattle. Uh, you know, we, we held animals down in a particular area, you know, for, for a week. Then we were able to push a fence that moves those animals from the bottom up to the top. You know, we have patented in our system this idea of a one-way fence. So when an animal is pushed through this fence line, it doesn't actually see or feel or hear anything, but then it is suddenly captured in this, in this new area. And by doing this, you're able to take a you know, couple hundred acre pa pasture, subdivide it, and never have to even walk out into the pasture to see that it's been actually rotationally grazed. Size of the market and, and how we're going to the market, you know, our, our belief is, is that, you know, this intelligence layer that we really want to add in, you know, we're, we're starting with you know, a subset of the population. So we're starting with farms that have in excess of 200 head of cattle and you know, in Australia and in the U S we're charging them 35 plus dollars a year per animal, you know, translates into still a pretty, pretty large. Uh, market opportunity. When we think about that, you know, total addressable opportunity, we're starting, you know, on the right side of this screen in, you know, US and Australia, we think as we add in more and more data and analytics and features, we'll be able to upsell, you know, those devices as well as we will continually expand into smaller farms from that, you know, kind of 200 uh, head into, you know, the, the kind of larger population as well as other geographies. The broader opportunity, as, as you might imagine, is this kind of land and expand opportunity, not just, you know, on farm, but into farm. So the, the customer base is going to have this ability to look at things like animal fertility and animal health detection, as well as layer in additional sensors into that network, which we've already installed on their on their farm, so the ability to put in soil sensors and water sensors, and have those drop, plug and play connect to the network, you know, are all things that we view as coming down the road fairly shortly. And then there's this huge opportunity we believe of now having a platform which could directly connect our customer base, which is generally one that is not too easy to connect with when you're talking about a remote ranch you know, anywhere that a ranch exists mostly and the ability to sell directly to that person or have a, have a product that is relevant to whatever problem they're having be, be offered directly to them. And then the, the elephant in the room being the ESG side of things, the ability for us to take the customer's actions and how they're managing those animals in a sustainable way and translate that into a new product for them to monetize in the form of soil organic carbon tons. And we are already deep in some discussions as it relates to, you know, with some partners to, to find ways for them to monetize that. You know, that's all I had prepared for today. I've kind of wanted to, to keep it fairly short. And so I could open up for, for, for questions and comments, happy to, to kind of revisit slides or you know, go anywhere that, that, that people want us to go. I think you're on mute there. I'm seeing in the chat, there's, there's just a question here about, you know, when will these slides be available? Yeah. My, my guess is that David who's hosting this would be able to, uh, to distribute those to, to, to people and 
you know, have Hey, Frank, can you, can you hear me now? I can. Yep. Hey, so sorry about that. I'm not sure where the connection dropped for me. I didn't mean to cut you off. If you were, if you were making a final point here. No, I was just coming. Like there's, there's, uh, it looked like, looked like somebody in the chat had asked about will the slides be available, uh, and I was just saying I'd imagine that uh, this will be posted on YouTube and, and that also the slides yes. will be accessible. Yes, certainly they they will be. And and Frank, thank you again. This has been a really I think excellent primer on vents, and I I, I think at the one of the things that's most interesting is at the surface level what what vents allows ranchers to achieve is. It's fundamentally actionable and solves a key problem today, but there's so many other applications I'm hoping we can talk about that you've, you've touched on a little bit in the presentation. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if there are any questions from the audience, the best way to ask those is to type those into uh, the Q&A box, and I'll answer them in the order that they are received. But just to sort of kick things off, you touched a little bit, Frank, on further applications and sort of what the ability to move cattle allows, allows vents to do. What do you see as being the next most actionable item that you would go uh, from moving cattle um, into? And then I, just to add on to that, are there any applications that customers have requested from you that have been surprising in any way whatsoever? Because obviously you started off with a vision on how to move cattle, yeah. but you probably learned so much from talking to them. Like, what about this? Like, what can you do that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm constantly amazed about the things that we get asked. Yeah, so I, <laughs> that, could, that could lead down a little bit of a rabbit hole here. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess when I when I think about like you know immediate next applications, right? Our our device has an accelerometer on it, has an ambient temperature, has a you know a couple other sensors in it. You know, we view the immediate next steps are are, are looking at things like fertility, health, and, and and being able to offer that to in pasture customers, so the ability to start to look into the analytics of you know lame animals in field. You know, that that's kind of what we view what we have in our immediate roadmap on in terms of the existing device algorithms. We get a ton of requests for water monitoring. Mm -hmm. You know, pretty much everybody that we talk to would love to have us hook in a water monitor into the system. So we we view that as something that, that's likely you know pretty pretty high up on the on the roadmap just because it's it's not a an extraordinarily difficult add in and at the same time you know, it's a, it's a time suck for people to, to go out, check water, make sure that there's water in the, in the trough and, or that it's flowing. So those are, those are two quick ones. There's, there's a list of a good 50 other ones. I think that, that yeah. the longer, the longer, bigger one for our customer base is like our customer base has been restricted to selling one product, right? Uh, which is meat. Generally, we're talking about pastoral farmers and the ability to offer them an additional product to monetize in, in carbon is really interesting for them. And you know, we could sit here and debate how far off that is. It's going to be due to the formalization of the markets, due to what happens to the government, a bunch of, bunch of other things. We can already see it from our counterparts in Australia that it's coming and, and that you know, there's got to be demand for it. And so I think it's a really interesting time for, for our customer base when they, when they start to think about that, because they're going, oh, well, like, what would my, how would I manage things if I had a completely different revenue stream as well? Right. And so we think there's, there's a lot of questions around that that need to be answered, but it, it's pretty interesting because it's something that wasn't even on the table five years ago. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Frank. And that you kind of somewhat similar question, but maybe just going into the landscape of, of wearable solutions for livestock that have emerged over the last, say, call it five, five or six years, obviously beyond the tags that were sort of, that are, have already been previously available through the all flexes of the world. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction between a wearable device for, for cattle that allows them to be moved versus one that's perhaps just an ear tag? that measures biometrics and just sort of what the, not only the differences in what is required, but also what one enables versus what, what the other may not. Yeah. You know, I can get pretty deep on that, but I'll try and stay at 10,000 feet. You know, if you think about a, a kind of 
a wearable that is sitting on a device that is non actuating, which is what I would consider, you know, an ear tag that, that measures fertility, for example, that's a reporting device. It basically is constantly just sending data in one direction. To be able to take that device and suddenly tell it it needs to have instructions and have it dynamically be able to communicate back and forth that those instructions have been received, that those instructions can be changed, takes the problem and explodes it you know, on the communication side. You know, not It doesn't go from one to two, it goes from one to 30. Right. It's, it's a completely different dynamic when you are having a bi-directional communication system versus when you're having one that is kind of unidirectional. You know, when our, when we started to look at this problem, one of the things that for me really became apparent pretty clear is that we were building a communications platform and that animal management and control was an application which sat on that. And, and so when you're building a communications platform, what you need is a team of communications engineers. So that's what, that, that's what we have built our team fundamentally on is starting from this perspective of like, how do we, A, look at what our customers could pay, it, it, you know, in a theoretical scenario, and then build to that communication system that is purpose-driven for, for this particular application. And so, you know, we we absolutely think you know there's certainly a, a big market for for a lot of the wearables I, I, in the world you know clearly you know in the dairy sector that's that's been a huge success you know for the scrs and and, and for for a number of, of other folks i think that when you get into a pastoral scenario where you're talking about open range cattle management you know, you're not talking about an animal that if if it's not cycling that you can do something on that day because that animal could be two hours away from where you are and it may be extraordinarily hard to go and, and, and find a way to have an intervention with that animal. And so yeah. what you need is something that have enables you to actuate. How do you take control of that animal or that herd and make a decision on it based on the data that's occurring there? Not just suddenly have one new data stream that says, oh, there's another problem on your farm and there's nothing you can really do about it. And so we, we started with that control layer versus I think some people have started in the opposite direction, which we think is gonna be extraordinarily hard to, to do. Yep, certainly. I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any final questions or any questions from the audience. Now's a great time if you got them. There's one, one thing that stands out to me is just how large the market is here. I know you covered a slide on it a little bit, but I think it is helpful to perhaps just like reiterate for anybody listening, just like the immensity of how many animals there are, how even a small portion of that market is a huge opportunity, even within just a couple of customers. I mean, some of these customers have so many head of cattle that, you know, they can support a large business in and of themselves. I just, any information, any, any color you can provide there and just to provide some perspective on how big this opportunity is? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest version of that, right, is, is that there are more cattle on the planet than there are cars on the road, right? right? So, like, you know, everybody views cars as this kind of ubiquitous thing. And, and, and when people talk about things for the auto industry, they immediately are like, oh, my God, like, it's just this it's behemoth of an industry. Well, like, there are more cattle on the planet than there are cars on the road. Then you added another 900 million sheep, you added another 400 million goats, you added like you, you've got, you know, more than 50% of the population, the equivalent population of humans would be livestock that is on pasture. And so when, when you think about that and you say, okay, if you hit a small sector of that market, yeah, it's like, if you hit 10% of that market, it's like the equivalent of you sold a consumable good to every person in the United States. Right. Um, right. right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, there, there are obviously complexities. This is, this is, this is not a, 
this is not a consumer product, so we're selling into an industrial environment, which makes it challenging. But you know, that also for us, we view as a barrier to entry as well as as a competitive advantage over time as we continue to succeed there. That it's a that it is a challenging environment, and that it's one that you know we think that once we crack the nut, it's going to be it's going to be pretty pretty interesting for for everybody along for the ride. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Frank, we always like to ask our guests on AgriFood Conversations, um, what, how can the audience help you today and uh, how can they find you? Yeah, so my email is pretty easy, frankadvents.io. You know, I'm unfortunately always on it. And so feel free to, feel free to reach out, you know, www.vents.io is our, is our website address. I think that the, the things we're, we're looking for, you know, we're, we're just at this commercialization stage. So anybody who's interested in the, you know, that's running 200 plus head of cattle in the U S or, or Australia, we're certainly excited to talk to you about what we're building and, and, and hopefully partner with you. You had a, at a higher level, you know, I discussed and I topically mentioned some of the stuff that's going on, you know, on the policy side. You know, as it relates to carbon, as it relates to some of these, you know, some of these other sustainability initiatives, you know, to the extent people are involved in those markets or involved in those discussions, you know, we're, we've had our head down for you know, four years building a product and we're poking it up now and we would love help, you know, to, to, to point us in the right direction necessarily of who we should be talking to. Uh, we've got some good folks at, at iSelect who are, who are helping us in that, but if, anybody else is, is out there and, and wants to drop a line, I'm uh, more than willing to, to have a conversation. Perfect. Well, Frank, thank you again so much for your time. I uh, genuinely really excited about the work that Vence is doing. There's so much opportunity in the space uh, from a lot of different angles. So again, if you, if you think you have a way that maybe you can contribute to the Vence story and some of the good work they're doing, please, please do reach out to Frank or if you prefer to reach out to me, I'm happy to make an intro, whatever you're most comfortable with. For anybody who's new to this, to this webinar series, we host Agri-Food Conversations every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. If you want to share this with a friend, we welcome you to do replay. This webinar will be available in the next 24 hours, and new viewers can register for Agri-Food Conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. And then finally, if you'd like to learn more, uh, join us next week uh, when we host EIO Diagnostics, a company that has developed new testing systems for det the detection of mastitis earlier than previously possible. Frank, thank you again so much for your time uh, and everyone have a great rest of your Thursday.